and we will get kicked off. So thanks everyone for joining the chilly um, or frigid December uh, um, ITB2 Transmark community meeting. Um, I'm gonna kick this off. Jeff, if you could go to the next slide. So um, I, I have like a 30 second general update. Um, and the majority of what we're gonna do today is um, Jeff Plan and Mike Mendez, um, and others can certainly chime in as well, are gonna talk about the work that we've been doing over the past, um, really the past year. I'm, I'm, I'm very excited. We've been really, really busy getting a lot of new features added to I2B2. Um, and a lot of uh, additional features will be coming out in the spring. And so Jeff um, and Mike will take a, a deep dive into that. But I'm super, super excited about this. And um, and uh, so let's get it kicked off. So the next slide, Jeff, my only slide, um, is just to talk about upcoming events. So I don't know how many of you are going to be um, coming to AMIA in March. Um, but as you know, most of the I2B2 um, development team, at least the original I2B2 development team, are in Boston. So we're we're all going to be there. So um, if you have, if anybody has ideas of, you know, having a, a session before or after AMIA, or maybe planning a dinner or having some kind of a, you know, an I2B2 get together, you know, while we're at AMIA, you know, ping me because we'd love to. We'd love to see you. We'd love to like figure out how we can um, we can continue to to talk and communicate. So keep that in mind. Um, and then the big the big uh, um, billboard item is that our um, symposium this year is going to be in June. Last couple of years we've been doing it in September, um, which is September is great as well. But it it bumps up against a lot of other. Um, conferences um, and a lot of travel for folks. So we're going back to our original June time and it's going to be the 24th and 25th. That's a Monday and a Tuesday. Um, so folks can come out the day before, the weekend before. Um, I always tell people June is a great time. September is a great time in Boston too, but June is a super great time in Boston. Um, we're planning, you know, June will be here before we know it. So we're planning the agenda. Um, if anybody has you know, thoughts on, um, you know, the, the themes or if they want to present something, um, please, please reach out to me. We'd love to, to get your feedback. I've started to talk to a few folks already and we're starting to formulate ideas, but, um, but certainly, you know, let us know. Um, so with that, I think, Jeff, I'm going to let you uh, kick it off. All right. Okay. You can't hear me or anything. Let me know, but I'm just going to dive in. So I've been asked to talk about I2B2 1.8.0 and 1.8.1 today. And um, there are many, many people who have been involved in this release in a deep and intimate way. Uh, the people listed on the bottom of the screen, myself, Mike Mendez, Rita Meta, and Sean Murphy are the core team at, at National Brigham who did all the core work. But I always show these slides now at the beginning because there's just so many other people that have been involved in I2B2. And this release in particular, um, Michelle Morris and her work on I2B2 OMOP and Griffin Weber and his whole team, including Nick Benick on the web client have been um, really made the release. So, and this is, this is an approximate slide of the 250 locations around the world that use I2B2. There aren't 250 uh, dots on here because some have, are multiple hospitals in one place. But um, <clears throat> if you know of more, we don't want to add to the slide because I think we're missing quite a few. So first I'm gonna uh, review what is 1.8.0. And if you've come to these calls before, you've probably heard a lot of this, but now it is a packaged release. So um, just at the end of the year on 1220, we released 1.8.0. And in addition to a bunch of important bug fixes that will enable future changes in I2B2, um, we focus on these two things, a complete rewrite of the I2B2 web client um, that uses modern user interface elements. The, the code is going to be sustainable and supportable and work much better with modern web browsers. It has a new layout, it supports drag and drop outside of the browser panel. It's, it's quite impressive. And um, now we can do I2B2 on OMOP. So you can have OMOP 
as your data model for I2D2. I'm gonna get a few more slides on these, so I'll uh, go through these in more detail. Um, the, this is this is the new web client. You can see the general overall layout is the same, but the panels are vertical now. The user interface elements are a little more intuitive. Um, and I don't have a video, but the interaction is a lot smoother as well. Um, you, you know, you also get you can you can resize the panels like dynamically. There's not fixed resizing anymore. It's a real modern kind of web tool. Um, yeah, and let's see, I think I have one more. And and the uh, you can even do you know of course the complex tech, temporal query interface is part of this as well. So you can do all the things that you can do in the old web client. Um, there is a user interface working group meeting coming up uh, tomorrow, and I I think Diane, were you going to put the link in the chat for that? And can you yeah. discuss this and learn more about yeah. it if you're interested in coming to that. Yeah, we'll put a we'll put a link in the chat um, in a second, and that's a regular monthly meeting. But um, you don't have to join if you want to come tomorrow and just um, check it out. Um, Griffin Griffin Weber is actually the chair of that group. So Griffin, I don't know if you want to put a plug in for that. There we go. Yes, we're going to be um, uh, uh, over, over the next couple uh, meetings of that, as well as the user interface group. We're talking about some of the new features that will be coming out of 1.8 that one is Jeff was discussing today. In particular, um, kind of in the user interface meeting wish list for um, the web client, we did a lot of great improvements here, but it'd be nice to see um, you know, even more features that people have been asking for. And then our technology committee on technology meeting, some of the UI features may also require backend changes as well and rethinking how we um, implement some of the backend workflows like computational phenotypes and loyalty cohorts and um, streamlining those processes, which Jeff will also talk about a bit today. So hope to see people here um, at those two meetings to uh, think about what new functionality we may be looking at over the rest of this year. And Griffin, while you have your camera on, you, I believe, have implemented this new web client at Beth Israel. Do you want to say anything about that? Yeah, so uh, the I installed the 1.8, as well as the, some of the updates from the new um, ACT ontology. Uh, I have both old and new web clients together during sort of a transition period. Um, but 1.8.1 web client is finishing up a few things that are not part of 1.8. So um, while that is in the works, I have both kind of the legacy web client as well as the preview of the 1.8 for users to select from. Uh, I may keep the old web client available for users for a while. People are kind of used to that who've been using it for a, a long time and um, uh, it may be a little bit of a transition onto the, the new interface. So ITV2 on OMOP, just briefly, OMOP is a uh, another data model for EHR data that is also very popular. Um, and it works great, but it doesn't have like the query tools and the, the API, API for uh, for doing doing queries. It's a it's a data model and a bunch of R analysis packages. So it it does things that ITV2 doesn't, but we wanted to also make available the things that ITV2 does do to users of OMOP. So um, the, the IT, ITV2 has like five or six core tables. OMOP has, I don't know, I can't count on the fly, but like 15 or so core, core data tables that <clears throat> store data. But thanks to some work that was done, primarily by Lori Phillips in 2018, you can now uh, talk to different fact tables based on elements in your ontology. So uh, Michelle developed a version of the ACT ontology that touches specific OMOP tables as you query different elements. And this is uh, done through these, these tiny little views that make each of the OMOP fact tables, like procedures and drugs and conditions, look like an ITV2 fact table. Um, and it, it works quite well. We did a lot of speed optimization. 
to indexing and tricks like that. But the, the speed is really quite comparable now to uh, querying on a traditional ITB2 table. Um, the secret sauce in the ontology is there are these hidden nodes at the bottom that have OMOP codes. The standard OMOP code, there's also a non-standard OMOP code. That way it can, it can touch, it, it's queryable in all of the ACT terminologies, but it can touch um, like SNOMED codes that are sitting in your, in your OMOP data. Uh, so it works rather well. And here is just a complicated query that was running for a while. I think it's a, a 3 million patient data set. So it was a bit of a slow query. This, this slide, I think, was made before we did the final speed optimization. So I bet it would be even faster now. But in 48 seconds, we it ran this uh, complex query on a very large OMOP data set. Um, and we do have the, uh, the old... The old plugins are still working. You can still do timeline. You can still do export XLS, uh, say with a caveat that there, we discovered after the release there are, are in some browsers, there are some issues with export XLS that will be fixed in 1.8.1. If you need to do that and you're having trouble, then just drop us a line. You can make sure you have the latest code. Uh, 1.8.0 release is on itb2.org slash software and uh, community.itb2.org. And the links are approximately for the same thing, though. The, the, there's, there's, there's more links on the wiki for getting source code and, and smaller chunks and things like that. But you can, you can go pretty much to either place and download that. Um, currently, the 1.8.0 is not Shrine approved. Um, we are working on that in the new year, and we'll have that. And then very shortly after 1.8.1 is released, we'll have that release too. So 1.8.1, I'm going to move right into that, um, which is is a release that we're going to roll out to all of an act and a release that we're very excited about that builds on the things we did in 1.8.0 and adds a lot of important new stuff. So the icons on the right will make sense as I go through. Once the bullets on the left are all there, but I made them, I made them appear one at a time so I could re remember to talk through them all. So as Griffin said, the web client team is enhancing the web client. Some things that that I'm excited about that I think are maybe the, the top billing items are improvements in stability, um, improvements in the icons, which um, although the whole user interface is like brand new user interface, it, it, some of the icons are still our old uh, YUI icons. So that's going to be that's going to be revamped, and there will be some some new admin tool, which is the one piece of the web client, which was not rewritten at this point. Um, we're going to, a big theme of this release is we're going to include a library of tools to make derived facts. So derived facts are just pieces of information that go into a special fact table or other ancillary tables that provide more information based on uh, the data that you have. So one of these is going to be loyalty cohorts, which I have a slide on. I'll go into more detail, but it helps you find cohorts of patients where you, you have a high likelihood of complete data. So if a patient doesn't have a mention of diabetes, they probably actually don't have diabetes, which can be very powerful for certain analyses. Um, computable phenotypes, which allow you to say with a higher degree of confidence that a patient actually has a disease. So rather than just saying, a diagnosis of diabetes, but you can say the patient actually has diabetes. And those things don't correlate actually because of the way billing works. There are a lot of people who have only tested for diabetes who have a diagnosis of diabetes in the system. So that's an important thing for, for computation and research. And also we continue to do data quality work with fast patient counting scripts. Um, these things are all going to enable I2B2 for a future of being used for research and like really actionable, powerful things you can do with the data. So it's not just a warehouse of your EHR data, it's a warehouse of knowledge about your EHR data. Uh, there's also a really cool data export extension. I have some slides in, down in the road a bit, and I'm going to just hand it over to Mike to talk when I get to that, because uh, he wrote this data export extension. It's pretty cool. Uh, but basically, it allows administrators to set up a way for people to export uh, ITB2 data from a cohort query and save it to a file using the breakdown mechanism. Um, 
Other things that I'm not going to go into more detail on other slides, but want to mention are coming in 1.8.1. Uh, ITP2 on OMOP does not currently support Postgres for uh, some technical reasons, and we're working through those, and it will in 1.8.1, which hopefully will allow our European colleagues who are using OMOP to use it with ITP2. Uh, we're going to have a mechanism to quickly install large ontologies, which might just be putting ontologies in an S3 bucket, uh, or it might be a very cool ontology store that University of Pittsburgh has developed uh, that I won't go into more detail on that in this call, but if we decide to include it, we we'll definitely know more about that. Uh, and of course, the Enact Ontology version 4.1 and a bunch of bug fixes, of course, because we always do. Um, so derive fact library, just very briefly, if you count the number of patients that have everything in your ontology, then you get this nice catalog of where your data is the richest in terms of patient counts, which will can help you can help guide you in cohort query design. But if you do this across a bunch of sites, as we're doing in an act, you can, we can see who what how your data compares to other data and where you have either data quality problems or just data differences. Like we we see uh, sites in the south have more skin cancer patients than sites in the Northeast, which is it just, it, it's telling it's telling a true thing and that's very good. But it also can help you find where you have outliers, where you have things that are just missing your data. Um, you can look across refreshes. This is the, the line graph in, on the uh, second from the left, on the right. Um, this is showing like over time, Data increases because you add data to a data warehouse, you don't delete it. Um, and, and that's what you would expect to see. You wouldn't expect to see a drop over time. And you can look at mapping variation. So there's a lot of interesting stuff going on there. Uh, there's this loyalty cohort concept that uh, we developed this tool in SQL that computes a loyalty score. This uses um, a validated set of proxy criteria in the electronic health record that was developed and validated by a Harvard School of Public Health researcher. And we, we implemented this on uh, several sites in the ANAC network. Um, it assigns a score to every patient that is a likelihood that they have complete data, meaning what we know about them is everything we need to know about them. And um, we validated that and it worked pretty well. So that will, that will improve our ability to compute with confidence. Um, and then computational phenotyping. Uh, this is actually phenorm and not comap, but the idea is the same. Uh, you take patient features and you apply math to them and you get this normalized function where it splits the positives and the negatives. The patient's actually with diabetes versus just with a diagnosis of diabetes in the system. And um, you, get, you get a function that allows you to uh, choose patients that actually have a disease and not just a diagnosis code. And there are, um, Griffin and Tian Chi's team developed a, a, a lot of, a lot of code that will compute this for you on your ITB2 that creates embeddings and generates features from those embeddings and uses, uh, uses all of these tools to create uh, phenotypes that go in, uh, go into your derived fact table. So this is this is a slide about what happens to I2B2 database complexity. So the next version of I2B2 will have a lot more tables. They might not be tables that have anything in them if you don't use these features, but we're, we're thinking through how we're going to organize these tables. So we've got the star schema tables, the fact and dimension, maybe OMOP tables, maybe a derived fact table that you created. Um, and additional additional CRC tables, but but then you know if you if you're using 4C, you have all these 4C star tables. If you do loyalty cohort, you have loyalty cohort tables. If you're using computational phenotypes, you have Kesser and Comap tables. So um, so there, there will be new tables in I2B2. Um, now I'm going to talk through the Enact ontology version 4.1. I did not develop this ontology, and I am probably not qualified to go through these slides, but Michelle gave us these slides, and I will do my best. 
Um, there are 19 ontology tables. Not everything was changed. A lot of them were updated up to 2022 AB, uh, which is you know an important upgrade to have because you have all the new and changed codes. Um, there's other cleanup that happened. And then there's a few brand new things, which are exciting. Uh, so unchanged ontologies, things like uh, the lab, the vital signs, the ICD-9, the old ICD-10 and 9, um, or 9 and 10 hierarchy, the ICD-9 procedures, these things didn't change, didn't, didn't change, and they, they will not be changing, I believe. Well, I'm not sure. I, the lab and vital signs might change. But the, the old ICD-10 and 9, for example, will not be being updated because it relies on mappings that are no longer maintained by UMLS. So those, those are just maintained for, um, for backwards compatibility. Uh, minor modifications were made to demographics, visit details, social determinants of health and COVID. And I believe Michelle has some details on that. In demographics, there is a little bit more detail under some of the races and under Hispanic and under sex. Um, then in visit, you can optionally do pre-computed agent visit fields. So they don't compute on the fly, which overall saves computational time. And um, there are also new visit types that are optional, but they add different non-face-to-face -face encounters, medications and labs. So the, the COVID ontology has new uh, lab test codes and nice D10 task code which will be important for research on PASC. And then there were uh, cleanup, various cleanup things that happened as well. The updated ontologies are medications and diagnoses and procedure CPT, procedure HCPCS, procedure ICD-10. Um, major change was HCPCS was added to medications grouped alphabetically, but overall it was an upgrade and uh, some cleanup. The new stuff is research, zip code, and vaccination. So starting with vaccination, there's this uh, vaccination tree using it has CPT4 and NDC as the uh, as the leaf nodes. So you could put your vaccination information into I2B2 in standard way now, and that will eventually be queryable in um, in the Enact network as well. And uh, this is zip code. This is a zip code querying querying on steroids. You can query by zip code or just zip three, if that's all you have, or by city and county. But there's new stuff too. You can query by rural or ur urban continuum codes or hospital referral regions, which, uh, so a hospital referral region is an area around which people who, if they live there, they probably utilize the same set of hospitals. So you can group, group people uh, the Dartmouth Atlas uses this to group patients. So you can look at different hospital referral regions and find patients who probably get healthcare at the same institution. Rural urban continuum codes has to do with uh, with, with the uh, the rural and urban continuum. I actually, I actually, I don't know the details on that, um, but but I could pause and ask Griffin if anyone's interested. Yes, it's a, a value. I think it's from like one to nine, where it um, divides different regions into whether they're an urban setting or a rural setting. And then within that, based on uh, the size of the cities, the population density. So it's, if you want to do a query for patients who are within a region of a population density or near a city of like a million or more, you can do one code. Or if you're looking for a rural area that's not near any hospitals or uh, urban centers, you can query that as well. And these are just different ways of um, kind of geographically slicing data um, for um, for health disparities research, as well as it's related to loyalty cohorts because patients within, um, as Jeff said, like the hospital referral regions um, tend to go to the same healthcare centers. So if you have a patient within your the HRR of your hospital, it's more likely that they are a real patient within your within your organization as opposed to a patient who lives elsewhere and just kind of came to your hospital one time for an emergency room visit, for example. So th these are these are just kind of different ways of grouping um, and rolling up zip codes for different kinds of analyses. Thanks, Richard. Yeah, so all of, all of these new things are 
you know, moving ITV2 into a place where it can really be used actionably for research better. And this new research ontology is definitely falls into that. The, the research ontology gives you information on the on the right. You can see it, it breaks things down into Charleston comorbidities and Alex Hatter comorbidities. So you can look at uh, patient uh, um, morbidity burden and, and risk of death. Um, on, on the left, you you can query things that are needed for NIH enrollment tables, which is which one needs in order to uh, submit NIH grant applications. And uh, this, this just makes it very simple to do that. There's actually an enrollment um, table breakdown that one can use to just generate that enrollment table. And it, it's not in this cool layout, but that is uh, planned work. And uh, let's see what we have here. So you can also look at the number of patients with these. Um, and these are these are based on um, Charleston codes, and so not they're not like computational phenotypes, but they are uh, based on uh, you know a validated way of counting patients. Um, and, and so you can get, quickly get a count of patients with uh, with all of these different types of conditions. And the same can be done with um, diagnoses there. And you can you can also do um, most frequent medications, most frequent diagnoses. So the breakdowns are breakdowns are getting a lot of enhancements. And again, this is not this is not to the core ITBT breakdown system, which is a testament to the the code. Just it just builds on what's already there. Uh, and you can do data completeness queries as well, and, and you can look for a number of patients with at least a diagnosis or at least a lab, um, or patients with visits uh, at least from a year ago, which also allows you to find enriched cohorts uh, that meet your inclusion criteria more easily. Um, fee codes are fee codes are included as well. Fee codes are a kind of a digestion of, of ICD-10 codes that group them together. Um, and there will be many more things added to this ontology in the future. So you can download that here. I think we're going to distribute the slides. And then um, then we, we've covered the ACT ontology. Now we need to cover the bulk exporter. There's a lot going. Um, so, Mike, uh, I can read through your slide, but I imagine you probably want to do something. Do you want to run through the slide, or do you want me to give you the sharing? Because you can do a demo if you want. Um, I mean, you, already, you want to go through the slides? I mean, I, I'll do a quick demo afterwards, but... Okay. All right. You want, you want me to go through the slide? Yeah, sure. Okay. All right. So, the idea of this bulk exporter is to create flat files, like CSV files, that you can download and use in your um, your analytic in your analytic programming, like in your SAS code or your R code. And um, the the export that is done is created by defining a breakdown in the database. But the breakdown specifies a SQL query, and that SQL query gets saved to a CSV file, which allows an administrator to set up different types of data exports that uh, people can then request and download in their um, in, okay. in their I2B2 with, of course, appropriate permissions and access controls and things like that. Um, yeah, so the uh, it, it's it's fast. It exported 35 million observations four gigabytes of data in 10 minutes. Um, it's all configurable in the high cell parameters and the breakdown code, the breakdown tables in the database. And the files can be automatically compressed. I uh, think Mike's working on a way to you know, automatically email the files too, if that's something an administrator wants to enable. Um, and it all piggybacks on the ITV2 breakdown code. So you run a query and you click, I want a download of all the facts or all the diagnoses or whatever you want. But you click, you just click a breakdown and the file is generated and you can get the file. 
Uh, this gives us the advantage of making it very straightforward for users to use. And also, because it fits into the existing I2B2 infrastructure, you get some fault tolerance. So if, a, you know, if an export is taking a long time, it goes into the queue, and the queue manages whether it's run, and it doesn't clog up the uh, I2B2 um, user interface. Uh, this was done by creating a new breakdown class, which extends I2B2 functionality. And it's all, all the configuration is done in the database. And of course, FISMA was in mind when this was designed. So that's, that's the slides I have on this. Um, I'll come back to this later. Uh, Mike, do you want to give a quick demo? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, let's see. Share. Um, okay. Um, should see my screen. Yep. Cool. Uh, yeah. So actually, Jeff, that the new name that you called it in the, the second or third slide, I like that name. Oh, I always call it, bulk, I call it whatever you called it. I remember I always called it bulk exporter, which I didn't like. But then it was like you picked it in one of your slides, you had a new name for it. And I like that name. So I think that's what we're going to stick with. Uh, but yeah, like Jeff said, uh, basically, there's a lot on the back end, very little on the kind of the front end. Um, I know I, in the past, I had talked about making a plugin uh, called like bulk exporter, where you kind of drag a patient result over and you select the ones that you want. I'm actually abandoning that whole idea. And what I'm actually going to do is when you do your find patients and you grab whatever you want, you do find patients, there'll be another tab, like another column in here. Instead of query result, it will be like export results or something. And it will have the ones that you can specify that you download the patient demographics, the patient data, and patient data again, because I was playing with the code. Uh, and basically all you do is you just select them and it will create the CSV file. Um, another thing that we were thinking of doing was in the PM uh, table, there's a column for email. And so I was thinking about once the process is complete, whether it takes, how, how long it takes, it could still into the medium queue, it will take long because that has queued up. Uh, but then it will just email you the, uh, where it is. Uh, it will, and you can specify it to, uh, to save it to some file share somewhere. And then you can go pick up the files there. So it, it, I think it makes it a lot cleaner and easier uh, by just putting it as part of the query results. And because it's a breakdown, like Jeff said, all the queuing and all the breakdown stuff, um, we benefit from that. So yeah, so this is gonna be part of the 181 uh, release. Uh, most of the backend coding is completed. Uh, I still have some more testing to do. Um, obviously a little UI changes that need to be done. Uh, but yeah, it's on schedule for release in March. So, like I said, it's not much to really show because a lot of it's all on the back end and configurable. All right, cool. I'll I'll show my last, like, I don't know, five slides. And I have can... a question. So, Mike, is, it, yeah. is there a special role that those will be visible to? And does it go directly to the user or does it go to an admin? Um, so the roles, you can specify whatever roles you want. Typically you'd want LDS, a limited data set. Uh, that's what the current, uh, some of the breakdowns are set to. You can increase it to, to uh, data prod if you want. Um, so yeah, that's all configurable as far as the roles. Um, and your other question about, oh, the file. So right now, I have it set so that it saves it to a file server, like a, a directory on the Wildfly uh, machine. So that could be also like your drive E if you want it on your Windows, or uh, you can map a drive to another server and have it saved onto that server. Okay, thank you. But yeah, right now I don't have a way that you can actually click on it and download it directly from the web client. Um, that might be a, a feature we add in the future. It's just, but I'm thinking people won't want that really. Okay. For yeah. secure, you know what I mean? Like, mm. I don't know, not enough control. Right. All 
All right, I'll run through these last couple of slides. Um, Mike, feel free to jump in on this one because I'm just reading what's here, but I know you're you're going to be hard at work on some of this stuff. So, uh, CentOS is um, you know is reaching end of life, so now we support Rocky Linux, and so we'll support Rocky Linux nine. We also realize that we are several versions behind on Wildfly in terms of what we support, and some changes did happen in Wildfly, so it requires a bit of work to allow people to use the newer versions, but it's important to for security reasons to get up to a newer version. So we'll, we're going to move up to 26. Uh, we're going to continue, of course, supporting Java 8, but I think 11, but we will add support for 17, uh, Windows 2022, and we will support newer versions of our three database platforms as well. Um, then post 1.8.1, Post 1.8.1, I didn't say 1.8.2, 1.8.2 will probably be the job scheduler. And Snowflake support will have a separate version of that that one will be able to download as with 1.8.1, but it won't be part of the core supported release. So, so the job scheduler we've talked about a lot. We're focusing for 1.8.1 on the drive fact library and making it easy for people to run these things to create the drive facts. Um, in 1.8.2, we'd like to have a mechanism in I2B2 where you can schedule these drive fact scripts to run and you don't have to do anything once you have it set up. Um, Snowflake support is, Snowflake is a, a, a da cloud database platform. It's very powerful. It offers a lot of um, nice features in terms of uh, actually secure data sharing. Um, and, and it can be quite fast as well. So Snowflake is going to be an important theme um, in I2B2 going forward. It's listed as post 1.8.1 only because it, it's not going to be part of the core platform where we're supporting all the features of I2B2. But as a separate download, you'll be able to um, hook I2B2 up to Snowflake, and it will become more and more important as time goes on, I would say. All right, this is a set of slides that I did not change from other presentations, so I'll just run through them real quick. So people are aware, I2B2, find everything at community.itb2.org, www.itb2.org, especially slash software, um, and then the Google group where you can ask questions. It's called install help, but you can ask any of your questions there. Um, the, if you want the source code in the raw form, you can go to the GitHub, and there's also a Jira where you can submit issues and track new features. We also welcome uh, submissions uh, to our GitHub. You can submit a pull request. Um, it is helpful if you tell us that you've submitted a pull request, because we don't always look at those too often, but we are very excited to, uh, to take community contributions. Um, and that is all of the slides I have, uh, but let's have a discussion on um, on what we talked about. And Michelle, if I butchered anything on your ontology slides, please let me know if that's that. You're better than I would have. <laughs> it was only made possible by your great slides, though. We're a good team. Just to answer the... Um the uh, note in chat, the recording and the slides will be posted on the, um, the I2B2 website. Um, it usually takes us about a week or so um, to post those, but absolutely they'll be there. So who has questions? Would you like us to be doing? Is anybody planning on implementing um, 1.8, the new user interface, anytime soon? Or are you going to wait for 1.8.1? We're actually moving forward with 1.8. This is Gigi from UF. That, that's great. Um, you know, I think Griffin at, at BI um, implemented it uh, over the um, 
the winter break. Um, so you'll be one of the first. So we we definitely want to hear, you know, it's a, it's a big deal. That user interface is a, it was a major, major change. And, you know, we have, we have a separate team of people that are, are working on uh, more enhancements to it. But um, if you find any, you know, any um, issues or, or anything, please let us know. Probably put it on yes, top I, of all servers. As I mentioned, yeah, there we've had ITB2 at Beth Israel Diggis Medical Center for over a decade. And there are a thousand users who are used to using ITB2 in a certain way. And you know, if you're a brand new institution, of course, it makes sense to use the new UI. But it's you know, I'm it's gonna be interesting to see what feedback I get from people who develop queries for many years in the um, old interface and what they think about the new one. So, you know, it's, um, you know, it's a needed change and I think it's much better and uh, the old libraries are gone, it's important for security, but, um, you know, I, I don't know exactly how long it'll take to get everybody over and what concerns people have. And, and so we've, we've kind of, we've tested the functionality and we know it works great. And the original design was based off of focus groups of users who hadn't really seen these tools before, but we haven't had this actually pushed out to um, organizations where people are familiar with I2B2 and have their ways of doing it. And, and um, be curious just to see how um, how users react to that and um, you know how much transition time institutions need. I'm, I think I'm excited about being able to drag outside of the box, like what, what possibilities that'll open up. And then the, um, you guys didn't talk about it much, but is there a new plugin structure in 1.8.1 or is that moved out? It mostly supports legacy plugins is a kind of a, a wrapper that goes around them to support it. Then there's a brand new um, plugin framework that leverages and can take advantage of kind of modern HTML5. And that's where kind of the cross browser um, drag and drop would be enabled. So for new plugins, you'd use a new framework, but if, if institutions have existing plugins that spend quite a bit of time developing, there's a way to keep those um, running in a new framework. Now, are there um, gonna is there documentation or like a, you know like a little cookbook in how you develop these new plugins? Yes, um, <laughs> there is, is a lot there. I think there's some videos on it. So you know, Nick Bennick put together documentation for that, but um, it's this is a brand new thing. So I'm guessing there's going to be a lot of once people actually start migrating plugins over or developing new ones, there'll be some feedback and. Uh, well, that will um, evolve. And we can set up, you know, um, yeah. sessions, you know, monthly sessions where people can come and get like training or updates. I know in the, the last September symposium, uh, Nick Bennett, who was the uh, the architect of, of this new framework, actually spent an entire hour um, like building. A, I think, it, I don't know if that was the I don't know if it worked super well at the conference, but it is, we do, we do have that on video. So you can go back to the, um, the, the conference for September and, and look at his uh, presentation and get an idea of, of the different, um, of what you need to do. So. Cool. I think that, you know, when, once this rolls out, you know, it, it, I think, um, Jeff had mentioned that 1.8.1, which obviously includes the new UI, is going to be rolled out to um, all of the Enact sites, um, which is you know a big chunk, 50 sites or something like that. I mean, Michelle knows the number. Um, Mark Suriola would know as well. I mean, so we're we're going to start to get a lot of uh, people in the um, in the community, you know, up on this new user interface. So there should be synergy and um, you know among the different uh, the different groups. So. I'm excited about that. I think Mark has his hand raised. Uh, yeah, this is Mark Abajian from Los Angeles. Um, 
great presentations. Thank you very much. Um, I had one question about um, the new interface for 1.8. And I was wondering, um, is it possible to get the code for the new interface? And will it be supported if my, if my server is not 1.8 yet? So can the new interface be applied to a, a 1.7.13, for example? Yeah, you don't need 1.8 to um, to use the new user interface. We, we uh, you know, so the caveat that we we support it in 1.8, and so if it doesn't work in an earlier version, then we'll tell you to upgrade. But yeah, it does work in 1.7.13, definitely. Thank you very much. And is the, co we the have... code still on GitHub, right? Yeah, yeah, the code is, yeah, the code's in the GitHub, you know, the ITB2 web client. It's not compiled. The you download a set of HTML and JavaScript files, just like the old web client. So you put the code on your web server. And so it's 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 the same thing. It's not like there's the, a compiled binary where you download for a backend application. So when you go to the I2B2 website and go to the software page and download it, you are getting all the code and assets. Just to answer Mark's question, we uh, at Autoimmune Registry, we put the new interface on top of our old uh, uh, CRC, and it's working fine. It's on. It's great. Yeah, the the changes in one point eight point zero over one point seven point thirteen are there. There are some bug fixes to the core server that will enable some of these fancy breakdowns. Um, but for the most part, the changes were only related to ITP2 on OMOP and the web client. So you can you can put the web client on earlier. On earlier versions. Um, I'm also I'm not seeing the plugin development guide on the wiki. I know that it's been written, and I will I will add to my to do list to get that onto the ITP2 wiki. So I'm excited about you know the the few sites that are going to be installing this you know over the the spring and um, definitely want to have at the, the June meeting at the end of June, uh, definitely a session. And now that I'm, I'm, I'm seeing this is maybe get the sites that implemented it and get them together, maybe a little panel where they can talk about their implementation and what they, what they saw, what they liked, um, things they think they're missing. So I think that that, that would be, um, that'll be pretty interesting. Um, the other thing I want to mention is the user interface is going to be the first, like, big splash, right? Because we're finally getting that out. Um, but as um, Jeff had mentioned, and as we've talked about before, it, all of the code to support computed phenotypes is also being rolled out with 1.8.1. And, you know, that's a that's a bigger commitment and a heavier lift for sites. Um, I also think that it has some amazing promise in helping to um, get folks to be able to identify the correct patients for clinical trials. Um, so I'm pretty excited about that. So we'll definitely have um, more discussion about that. And, you know, hopefully a couple of sites that actually have implemented that um, in June as well, where we can talk about, um, you know, the, the, the difference between the two and how it works. Because um, that's, a, that's a major thing. That, that's a major thing that sets, sets us apart from all of the other um, networks and groups out there. Because um, Odyssey can't do that. N3C can't do that. So it's a, I think it's a huge win for for this community. Uh, but again, a, a bit of a heavy a heavier lift. Are there other questions or thoughts? Um, anything about the conference in June that comes to mind where you think we need to focus? Um, you can speak up now or or ping me later. Definitely want to make sure that we're. Um, we're uh, doing the right thing at those those conferences. All right.
right. Anything else? Otherwise, we will wrap up for today. And I thank everyone for uh, for joining. Um, again, these co community meetings are um, every other month now. So the next meeting will be in um, in March. Jeff, any last minute? Nope. nope. You, did, you, did, you did it. Thank, thanks for taking the lion's share. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, everyone. Happy New Year. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone.